Metal Gear Solid 2 is incredibly important to me, and as a result, I'm going to talk about myself in this outro more than I typically do on this channel. Three and a half years ago, I said this at the end of my video essay on Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. I've talked many times about how this was a defining moment for both my channel and my person. In the couple of months that this channel existed before that video, I did my best to keep things as impersonal as possible. I provided what I took from various pieces of art and diluted the mix with as little of myself as possible. At that moment though, for the first time ever, I talked about my fears, my apprehensions, my hopes, and my feelings. Since then, that's become the main thing that separates my channel from others in my eye. These videos, ever since that Metal Gear Solid 2 one, have always been about me. The games and movies that I talk about on this channel, 90% of the time, have been nothing more than a medium for me to express myself to you all, canvases for me to paint my feelings onto. I've told you all dark secrets about myself and shared the lowest points of my life with you, all because in my eye it's critical to what makes me leadhead. The viewers of this channel have slowly gotten to know me better and better with each video, and that interaction is the single driving motivation behind all that I've done here in these last few years. As scary as it's been sometimes, and as nebulous as the code of conduct for YouTubers is, I've bared myself to you all in all but one regard. There's one thing that I've been cowardly about. It's not a secret by any means, but it's something that I've always relegated to the bottom of long community posts, social media platforms where I have just a tiny fraction of the publicity I have here on YouTube, the absolute back corners of certain videos. All because I was afraid of what would happen to my career if too many people found out about this too quickly. I'm transgender. I've made videos in the past where, rather than using the facade of talking about a game or whatever, I've just been blatant, and shared with you a piece of myself in its rawest form. This is one of those videos. I can't live in fear anymore. I can't go make a video about some trans-themed piece of media and hide myself within it. I need to rip the band-aid off and tell my audience what's up with me. So for the sake of clarity, before I move into all the things I have to say about this, let me just get a few things right out of the way. This isn't a political video. This video has nothing to do with science, I won't be pontificating on the whole nature versus nurture thing or getting into worldviews or anything like that. I don't aim to be a soldier on the front lines of trans rights or whatever. This is just me sharing more of those fears, feelings, apprehensions, and dreams with you, just as I always have. If you want to project a political angle onto this, then I can't stop you, but just know that wherever you stand on the inherent politics of this phenomenon, I'm not aiming to change your mind on anything. I don't want to turn you. I just want to tell my story. It's been a little over a year since my first time ever wearing women's clothes in public, at least as an adult. And frankly, it's been one of the most emotional and interesting years of my life, and it's become a story that I just have to put to video. So, without further ado, here's my story. I remember way back in early middle school when my peers and myself were first beginning puberty. I really felt like I had zero people I got along with. All the boys that had been my friends through elementary school all started to have that sort of tough guy thing going on that a lot of middle school boys have. Everyone was quickly getting stronger and bigger than me. They were making fun of me for using words like comfy. On sleepovers, where parents surely forced their kids to invite me, I'd always be the one that ended up crying over something or another. If it wasn't for video games, I probably wouldn't have had a single friend. I figured that everyone felt like I did, and they were just better at hiding it. So, in a bout of middle school pseudo-stoicism, I chose to just suffer silently, rather than figure out if there was something I was just doing wrong. Over the years, I found myself in way more accepting crowds, meeting gay people for the first time, having friends that didn't really care about sexuality or gender. I mean, all this stuff was pretty new back then, at least in my area. While I wouldn't really become the life of the party for a few more years, social interactions got a lot more bearable through high school because of that, because I met people who didn't really care that I was a soft boy or whatever. I wasn't anywhere near as cool or trendy as these people, I mean, keep in mind I was still a gamer. But it was a group who would, at the very least, not make fun of me for being so emotional. Eventually, though, I got in this one relationship with this girl. It was both of our first serious relationship. 
we dated for a couple years, lost our virginities, and did all of that sort of stuff that, you know, you hear all through high school is gonna make you feel like a real man. The point is, for the first time, I was playing an overtly masculine role, and it was weird. After a year, though, I discovered that I was bisexual, and we took a break in our relationship, and this led to my first ever encounter with another man. I'm not going to get into all of that for obvious reasons, but it led me to a realization. I don't like playing the masculine role in relationships. And I don't mean I'm a bottom or whatever, I mean all the little stuff. I didn't like feeling like I wasn't allowed to show my weaknesses or vulnerabilities. I didn't like being the one that was protecting the other. While, yes, most relationships aren't so binary, I think anyone would have a hard time denying that in almost every relationship, heterosexual or otherwise, you know, there's the one person who's picking up all the heavy stuff. The man is the one who takes old yeller back behind the shed. The man is the one who knows the combination of the gun safe. The man is the one who does the bulk of the driving on the road trip. When someone says, don't worry, I'll handle this, it's usually the man. I don't like it, and neither do a ton of people, man, woman, or other. But it's an idea that's so ingrained in humanity that every single one of us grew up with these expectations being projected onto us. And those expectations... I just felt like they were better off put on someone else than me. And that's when I knew things weren't going to work out with that girlfriend of mine. It's not like I don't like women anymore, but what I wanted out of a relationship had suddenly changed so drastically when I saw that there was another way to go about being partnered. Before long, I was shaving my legs and chest and painting my nails and eventually, once I was single around age 17, stealing stuff from my sister's bedroom to try on in the dead of night in front of only one confidant who was way too drunk to say anything other than, you look hot. Eventually, I got a job that had me going to a bunch of construction sites where my peers were a bunch of burly construction workers and painters and rich old white conservatives. Ultimately, I agreed to stop painting my nails and shaving my legs and all of this stuff for the good of the company. You know, nobody wanted me supervising job sites looking like that. And really, by that point, I was way too much of a stoner party animal to really care about things like identity. Eventually, though, I sobered up and started this channel and began to reforge my identity. And around the time the pandemic started, I quit working for that construction company and started door dashing. Almost immediately, I went straight back to how I'd been doing things before. Colorful nails, poofy and eccentric hairstyles, a shaved body and face. I had just lost a job that I really enjoyed, but in losing it, I managed to cobble together something resembling the identity that I'd drowned in bong water years earlier. Long nights on the road, delivering food to those who didn't want to leave home in light of the pandemic, I had a lot of time to think. I'd think about premises for movies and games and concept albums, but I always kept coming back to one name for an imagined character, a stand-in for myself in almost all cases. Penelope. Sometimes, Penelope was a girl who sobered up and found something to be passionate about. Other times, she was a girl who learned to care about her personal finances and start acting like an adult. Sometimes, she was just a girl who liked to drive. She would stay in the back of my mind for a long time. Eventually, though, my confidence bolstered by the free time allotted to me in starting a full-time YouTube career and the anonymity afforded to me by the sudden popularity in face masks, I started presenting female dresses, skirts, makeup, the whole nine yards, even an embarrassing wig as I had shaved my head at the start of COVID. I told my friends, my family, the people on my Discord server, and those who sat to the end of a particular video of mine to call me whatever pronouns they wanted. She, her, he, him, they, them, whatever. I told them that I was trans questioning and I wanted to try out all the different standard pronouns and see which ones I really liked. I lost a couple of friends that day and a whole lot of subscribers and boom. It had only been a few days that I was publicly questioning my gender, and I was already living in fear of what liberation would cost me. Fear that's finally being addressed today. A little bit later that year, my channel was hacked. Frankly, I wanted to die, and I mean that with all the subtext it implies. I had realized that so much of my personal worth and my planned future was wrapped up in one fickle little thing called YouTube a soul operated by a company that would never know my name. That night, at my lowest point in memory, I said, screw it, let's do this. And I announced on the Discord server and my friends and my family that I was going full she, her now. And I told all my friends that they could call me Penelope. 
the one good memory from that day. Just like that, I was Penelope, period. It would take a long time for the smoke to settle and for me and those dear to me to get used to this new name and these new pronouns. I'm sure you can tell that a year later, I still have some growing to do in almost all regards, particularly voice. But for the first time in as long as I could remember, I wasn't asking questions, I was giving answers. I was starting to feel better than I had since, well, basically since I hit puberty in the first place. However, that didn't mean that everything instantly got PG overnight. Nope. No matter how you split it, this last year has been one of the hardest in my life. Or at least the start of it was. See, like any person that early into their transition, I had basically zero idea what I was doing at the start of this year. A couple of my friends would give me giant recycling bags full of old clothes, meaning my style was basically that of a 16-year-old girl at the time. The shaving was a nightmare, and it still is sometimes. I still felt like I needed makeup just to go outside. I'd spend 30 minutes every morning trying on different clothes, trying to find something that hid my boyish features. Gender-neutral clothes were totally out of the question. I wanted to be as unambiguously female as possible to avoid that awful feeling of being misgendered by a stranger. I was a mess, and my Instagram photos from that period will back that up. Just looking at those old pictures makes me want to delete the whole account. Regardless, even when I was only a few days in a presenting female, and let's be real, I didn't pass at all, I still felt more comfortable talking to people than I had maybe ever. Well, for the most part. See, it's not really accurate to use phrases like more or less comfortable. Things got better in some ways and worse in others. On one hand, I felt like my mannerisms, my affectionate way of speaking, my body language, and all those other social habits I'd formed over the years fit this new look way better than it fit me when I was in boy clothes. These clothes were more me. But on the other hand, things would get real awkward whenever I was misgendered, which was most of the time. And as a result, I'd constantly be overanalyzing my voice, my hair, whatever scraps of facial hair I might have missed that morning. And above all else, my, uh, well, be careful with skinny jeans. It was really awful. I, I absolutely hated the negative sides to it, but the positives made it worth it. I knew that it would get better eventually, but I also knew that I was gearing up for what would probably turn out to be a decade-long journey of self-discovery. No, a lifelong journey. However, even in my small Bible Belt country town, I never encountered much active bigotry, just weird looks occasionally. Online though, it was a different story. See, by this point I'd been doing YouTube full time for a couple months maybe. I was at like, probably a little under 200,000 subscribers. More than enough to stay fed if you play your cards right. And coming out as trans on YouTube was just the scariest thing in the world to me. See, it's not like I really care about getting those same five comments, you'll never be a real woman, etc., from random transphobes that would slide into my DMs or get banned within minutes of joining my Discord server. The real issue was, well, I'm a gamer. I make gaming content, and that's how I feed myself and stay warm. And as we all know, gamers can be pretty close-minded when it comes to this stuff. Again, I wasn't afraid of all the DMs, I knew that would happen. I wasn't even afraid of losing the couple friends I lost when I came out because, frankly, I was going to lose them anyways. What I was afraid of was people unsubscribing. Everyone around me would say stuff like, ah, screw them, you don't need a bunch of transphobes watching your stuff. And as nice as it would be if that were the case, that's just not how it works on YouTube. I need as many people watching these videos as possible. Say 10% of my audience is transphobic, well, by making this video, I've just lost about 28,000 subscribers. That's huge, and God knows that the algorithm will have just assumed I fell off and probably suppressed my content even further. I've never once asked people to subscribe, but I'd imagine a lot of trans people will watch this video without having come across my content before. So hey, if you're into video games and you like my writing style, I'd love it if you stuck around. I'm gonna need to make up for some lost ground after alienating whatever percentage of my audience leaves today. All shilling aside though, that fear was just gripping me every single time I tried to record a voiceover and maybe sounded a little bit different than I had the week before, or I had to show my face in a video for whatever reason, or god forbid my transition was too relevant to that week's topic for me to not bring it up. 
Again, it wasn't a secret, but very few people knew relative to how many of my subscribers will know the moment that this video goes live. Frankly, I was scared of my own audience. I still am, and that's been one of, if not the hardest part of this whole transition. But anyways, all of those feelings were inevitable for anybody in my position, that of a gaming YouTuber who just has to come out as a trans woman. Let's get back to the experiences that are a little bit more personal to me. Starting my transition, things were slow at first. I got some awful ratty wigs, regretfully I came out as trans questioning on YouTube while wearing one of them. I'd stuff bras with my socks and spend hours trying to get the dollar store makeup I had to look better than it ever could, but nothing permanent. The biggest commitment I made was getting laser hair removal on my face, which I chickened out of after two sessions for reasons that'll come up in a minute. Basically, I was just playing it by ear, trying to figure out if this is what I really wanted. It was a question that I really had trouble asking myself. What if I'm not really trans and this is all some big delusion? I didn't want to ask it. I'd be so embarrassed to go back to my family and friends and just say, Hey, sorry guys, I guess I was overly influenced by pop culture. This whole thing, it's not real. I'm sorry. That would, <laughs> that would really suck. And then on top of that, you had, you know, at this point, at least a couple hundred young trans people following me on Instagram and stuff, sending me DMs, calling me an inspiration and a role model, when really that was never the goal. But, you know, if I just had to turn around and say to them, sorry guys, I was wrong, that would crush some of them. You know, I don't want to put too much importance on myself, but that would put a lot of doubt in a lot of people's hearts for a situation that's already so mysterious. Now, don't get me wrong, if you're trans, you absolutely can change your mind, but in my position, it felt like there was a whole lot of pressure not to. Again, I didn't want to ask myself that question because I was afraid of what that answer might be, but one night I was just cruising around and I pulled up to my favorite spot in town, this one right here. And I just let myself silence all my worries and genuinely, objectively evaluate how those past few months felt. The good, the bad, the ugly. And I compared it to how I had felt as a boy at various points in my life. And, well, the existence of this video shows what my conclusion was. This was real. Oh boy. From this point on, a lot of that discomfort was lifted off of me. It was so weird to be an early trans girl, still unable to pass very well, but at least now I knew that I was working towards something that was right for me. But then, a whole new batch of worries set in. It was time for me to figure out just who the hell this Penelope person was. Obviously, my interests, my philosophies and opinions and dreams and all that stuff didn't just change, but how does Penelope talk? Or walk? What sort of clothes does she wear? Does she rock big sunglasses and floral skirts? Or does she wear a choker and fishnets as if to say, leave me alone to anyone who she approached? When she's trying to make a statement about herself, is she blasting death grips in the car? Or is she doing it to Keto Keto Bonito and Chance? And what sort of man is she into? That last one was actually a question that I had a lot of trouble answering as a man too. I'm even pickier with men than I am with women, but I know one group of men I don't like at all. Losers. See, probably about five months into my transition, I went on a date with this guy who was one town over. He seemed sweet, he was handsome, and he said he'd pay for lunch, so hey, what's the worst that could happen? It was my first ever date as a woman, and I was super excited, but uh, look, the guy was just awful. <laughs> A foot away from our waitress, he'd loudly said, I think you're so brave for wearing women's clothes. He offered to give me a back massage at a public bistro while I was trying to eat my sandwich. He said a whole lot of very explicit things over our date. He spilled vape juice and Mountain Dew in my car, fist bumped a man who had assaulted me at a party years earlier, and then he asked me to pinky promise not to ghost him while I was practically begging him to get out of my car. Oh, and he was high off his ass, having just been fired from the rehab clinic. Forgive me for ranting, but this guy was saying all this flowery stuff about taking care of me when I was making a clean salary off of my own labor 
and his only source of income was sending nudes to random old men in his town, no doubt even creepier than he was. And you know what? In spite of all of that, it felt really good to go on a date where I was very clearly, unambiguously the woman in the situation. He was like my own Mike Yamagita, and frankly I loved getting that date with a total loser experience. It's one of those things that just happens to women sometimes, and as many losers I've dated as a man, it just felt totally different this time. But anyways, in a desperate bid to get this womanizing pervert out of my car, I quickly said, Hey, I've got this thing that me and my family call vertigo, where I get insanely dizzy and need to lay down. Is it cool if I drop you off? I gotta go home. It's well rehearsed. I've said it a lot of times. This time, it was a lie to get out of an incredibly uncomfortable situation, but almost every other time, it's been true. Believe it or not, this part is relevant to the video, but it's going to take some explaining. More on that in a moment. Around the time of that first date is when I started passing halfway decently most of the time. It's gotten better and better since then, of course, but I'm very rarely misgendered anymore. Usually it's just my voice throwing people off when I wear more gender-neutral outfits or go through a drive-thru or something. I remember this particular moment at a gas station I go to almost every day. There's this older guy there who's always been making sexist jokes at me about his wife being on the rag. Stuff that weird old men say to younger men. At one point, though, he called me Hun when he handed me my items. Since then, he's kind of become a good gauge of how well I'm passing as female on any given day. He'll call me Sweetheart or Hun when he assumes I'm a woman, and he'll complain to me about his wife's periods when he assumes I'm a man. Funny stuff, but this was a new feeling for me. Next thing I knew, a staff member had given me her number at a restaurant, a random guy who was ahead of me in the drive through paid for my order, guys would practically break their necks to get the door for me at stores, people would refer to me as this young lady if I was wearing spunkier clothes, if I was moving things, guys would go out of their way to pick up the heavy stuff and load it in my car, and for the first time I'd feel practically no obligation to do anything but just stand there and look purdy, as that guy at the gas station would put it. It was... Well, it was awesome. I mean, it is awesome. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before, but this quickly gave way to, well, the bad side of being a woman. At least what I've perceived to be the worst side so far. The creeps. I've got this one romper, and last time I went out on it, I had this guy stand way too close to the cash register, forcing me to squeeze past him because I guess he liked the way my legs looked. I've caught people looking at my ass, I've had random men walk up to my car and try to chat me up when I was just trying to get some Arizona at the gas station. A couple months back, I was hanging out downtown when this guy came up to me. He asked for a cigarette, but what he really wanted was a cigarette and an especially handsy hug. <clears throat> Long story short, I used to keep this pepper spray on my purse because I was trans. Now I keep it on my purse just because I'm a woman. It's like I escaped all the discomfort of passive transphobia, only to find the other side of that tunnel. Casual misogyny. And that was a weird feeling. A small, annoying part of me kind of enjoyed it. Those were all awful experiences, but well, they were validating, just like the good ones. And I was still in a phase of my transition where validation was basically my vice. But back to that first creep, the one who spilled Mountain Dew right about there. Like I said, I lied to him about getting really dizzy so I could excuse myself back to bed. Well, I was only half lying. I do have a condition, and that guy did trigger it. About six years ago, I was playing GTA 4, the really crappy PC port that you can't run at a high frame rate, when suddenly I got incredibly dizzy. The world was spinning as if I was blackout drunk. I wound up passed out on the bathroom floor, and the dizziness stayed for another three days after I woke up. I couldn't keep down so much as a saltine cracker or a glass of water. To date, it's the worst thing I've ever experienced. Needless to say, there, there won't ever be a GTA 4 video. Since then, I've had a lot of these episodes, and for longer than I've been doing YouTube, there's been this background radiation of dizziness. All day, every day. Like, if I make the wrong move, or turn my head too quickly, or get too hot, or feel uncomfortable for whatever reason. I'm gonna have another vertigo attack, as me and my family call them. This situation gradually devolved to the point where it's sort of merged with some sort of natural agoraphobia I have. I mean, I've had to abandon my shopping cart at grocery stores because of this. 
I've had to bail on DoorDash orders. I've ruined dates by not being able to eat inside restaurants. I haven't even driven out of my state in nearly two years, something I used to do daily for work. It's the whole reason I bailed on my laser hair removal that I mentioned earlier. There have been times when it was so bad that I couldn't even sit at my computer and make videos for you all. The whole reason I have a Nintendo Switch is because of one time when I was essentially bedridden for about a month. There's very little rhyme or reason to any of my symptoms or triggers. No doctor or psychologist has been able to figure out what it could be or identify any possible reason for it to be happening. It's a miracle I became a full-time YouTuber because really it felt like computer work was just about the only labor I'd ever be capable of doing again. Making positive changes in my life usually made it better for only a few weeks before it just goes straight back to how it was. One such moment was when I started hormone replacement therapy. HRT was something I didn't think I'd ever want when I started my transition. I've never been a fan of using medicine to fix psychological problems, but eventually it felt like the right thing to do. I'd been depressed for years, not because of any inherent sadness, because it just felt like I was watching as my well of emotions just slowly dried up. Each day it was like I felt less than I had the day before. I hoped that if I started estrogen I could get more in touch with my emotions and so I changed my mind on it and managed to get started on HRT last August. I love it. I'm more emotional, I'm more energetic and optimistic. My body's already starting to change too. It's been an absolutely wild ride so far, but there's one moment that really stuck out to me. And that's the reason why I say that my transition saved my life. I never cried much in media before. I still don't really all that often. But a few months ago, I was re-watching Breaking Bad, and without spoiling anything, I bawled my eyes out probably six times over the final episode. See, it doesn't happen regularly like it does with cis girls, but a lot of trans girls, myself included, report having these little episodes where, for a few days, they're essentially on a period. Soreness, more dramatic emotional peaks and troughs, that sort of thing. I was on the tail end of one of these, and that Breaking Bad finale just ruined me. Crying at fictional drama, that was new for me. I didn't cry when my childhood dog was laying in the back of my car days away from dying. I didn't cry that time that I found out a guy I really cared about thought we were just a casual thing. I didn't cry when I missed Christmas 2020 with my family, and not once had I cried about my vertigo, a situation that I've said for years has been literally ruining my life. I was always such a nihilist. Oh, my life is being ruined by some unknown disability? Well, that's just how it goes sometimes. But here I was bawling my eyes out watching Brian Cranston hold a payphone. It felt like, like I had unlocked crying. Like I was remembering what emotions felt like after years of just emulating them. It felt insanely good, and wanting to ride that high, I drove down to the same spot where I decided I was trans in the first place, and the spot where I decided where I won HRT. This spot right here. And I just <laughs> cried my ass off for like an hour. I cried about my dog, and that guy who didn't love me, and the years of potential development wasted on drug and alcohol abuse and the fact that Montana, my amazing car that I loved like my own arms, was getting too unreliable to hold on to for much longer, and the friends I'd lost along the way, and the feeling of never fitting in over most of my adolescence, and the Christmas that I missed with my family, and my posture, my diet, the pandemic, the thousands I've spent on nicotine. But above all else, I cried about my vertigo. All the stuff above, that's the kind of stuff that just about everybody has to deal with over their life. They pass with time. The vertigo, though, that's one that's stuck with me for as long as I've been doing this channel, at least. And it's been ruining my life for so long. If I knew that I was going to be stuck with my vertigo for another 10 years, well, to spare you the phrase, I'd give up. I'd been using my nihilism like a shield for as long as I felt vulnerable, since like fourth grade, 
It's been my crutch through my entire life, but that night as I was wiping the tears off my steering wheel and my hoodie, I shed some of my nihilism for the first time in my life. I started to care about myself and it's all because of one milligram per day of estrogen fixing this connection that was just missing in my brain. The connection between myself and my existence. The next morning I made an appointment with the one type of doctor who I'd never consulted with on my vertigo, a neurologist. I'd always been afraid to go. I figured that they'd just prescribe me some awful pill after chalking it up to anxiety and I'd proceed to ruin my life with this pill. I mean, I've seen it with a ton of my friends. I had a lot of friends turn into pill heads growing up and I mean, you know, needless to say, I've got a very addictive personality. The doctor told me that my symptoms were kind of like those of a person with chronic vestibular migraines. But given that I didn't feel any physical pain because of my vertigo, she really didn't know what it was. Nobody has. She prescribed me a non-addictive, non-psychoactive medicine, the kind that wouldn't turn me into a drug addict or a drug zombie. And after two months on this random pill, the horrible, life-ruining condition that is vertigo is better than it's ever been. It's not gone entirely, but I'm getting stronger. I'm able to shop for groceries and eat inside of restaurants. And pretty soon I'm gonna cross that state border again for the first time in years. I'm getting better. When before, I didn't even want to get better. I wanted to get worse, just to make a point. My brain wasn't working correctly, and for me, estrogen was the cure. It's what filled the gap and rebuilt the burnt bridge between my mind and the fatalistic reality of being stuck inside of it. I'm not so much of a nihilist anymore, and I owe that to the estrogen. I'm someone who really, really cares. I get emotional about things, and that signal goes all the way down now. It's no longer just as simple as me thinking, this is sad and that's the end of it. Now it's, this is sad and therefore I'm saddened by it. Just, I just didn't feel like that before. I know I've always been pretty emotional on this channel, but again, it felt like just an emulation. Like one part of me was sad or happy or whatever, but the rest of my mind just wasn't able to receive that signal. I've got three records hanging up on my wall in my bedroom. And I'm saving this last space, the fourth space, up on top for when my boyfriend moves in and brings his own records. And just looking at that vacancy on the wall makes me feel genuine longing. The type of longing that I never thought I'd have access to. Christmas 2021, just 20 days ago, not even. It was my first Christmas with estrogen. and. I remember feeling so strange. I was actually happy to be getting gifts, like genuinely emotionally happy all the way down. I felt fuzzy inside, whereas before it felt like one part of my brain told the other that I was supposed to be happy, but the message was lost in translation, so I just put on a smile and hugged whoever gave me the gift. I get excited for those tiny wins in life now, like someone cooking a great meal for me or ranking up in a game. I smile when I look up at my guitars in the corner of my bedroom. I laugh at stuff harder than I ever did before, you can ask any of my friends. This all just sounds like normal human behavior, but I swear on my life that all of these things feel new to me. I thought I was a psychopath before. It felt like I would never really care about anything. Even in my subscriber milestone videos, videos that are supposed to represent huge moments of pride in my life, I just feel this air of disingenuity, if that's the word, coming off of me, like a robot that isn't living a life is just trying to look like it. And it wasn't that I didn't live, I mean, there were still things I'd get excited about, I'd still get sad about other things, but it just felt like I didn't have a horse on the race because I knew that whatever happened to me in my life, I would just feel kind of gray through the whole thing after a few minutes. And this is something that I think has been pretty regularly represented throughout my videos over the years. 
Just like in my Cruelty Squad video, or my Disco Elysium one. I'm talking about feelings of true disconnect from humanity, utter boredom with your own existence, because those are the things I've felt. Now though, well, I am rooting for myself. I look forward to my successes because I know that they'll feel incredible. I, I look forward to the future. Maybe I did have some sort of psychopathy. I know that's not really a term used in the medical world anymore, but I felt like a psychopath. Unfeeling, cold, calculated. I don't know if it was nature or nurture, but I've been missing something my whole life. Humanity. I don't mean to be too melodramatic. I wasn't totally emotionless before, but every feeling was just so hollow, like an emulation. Now though, well, this must be how all of those humans that I didn't fit in with felt. And these feelings have already driven me to making some huge positive changes. Today, I have a boyfriend that I love to death. I have a brand new home with a nice new office space. My old car, Montana, has been swapped out for Clyde, who's way more reliable. I'm getting out of bed as soon as I wake up instead of just wasting away. All this stuff was totally attainable for me before, but I didn't care enough to work for it. Today, I care about my life. Finally, and I'm happier than I've ever been. And today I'm telling you all, my audience, who I've loved and feared for so long, who I really am. I'm the person that was always inside of me and had almost given up hope on clawing her way out. I'm Penelope. You know, Pink Floyd is really good for road trips. Why am I talking about this? And why am I doing it at a McDonald's at 4 a.m.? Because this McDonald's is in Greenville, South Carolina. I finally left my state. Hell, I, I didn't really sell the severity of the situation in the video. I said I haven't left my state in two years because of my vertigo. In truth, I haven't even left my area code in two years. Almost two years to the date, really. And you know, none of this would have been possible without the estrogen, but the estrogen wouldn't have been possible without a few people. First off, my boyfriend. You know, these have been incredibly transitory times in my life, no pun intended, and he's been my rock through it. And then my parents for supporting me even though they all this stuff was totally new to them you know making me believe in myself as much as they did and lastly this is the end of the video so it might be a little impromptu but i'd like to thank my patrons especially those who donate ten dollars or more monthly such as four year nope whoops <laughs> such as ada avery almost dead again anatoly volnov andrew melnick ben n Benny, Big Time Jim, Bobby Blitz, Celadon, Colin Gajic, Cornelius Nelson, Darius Fazier, Demise, Dennis Fashakamer, Dominic Johan, Vralum, George Rosenbaum, IJK, Kenneth Enfinger, Laffy, Mixer Rules, Neurofilter, 
of Lucian, PJ, Raxvan, Robert Botang, Zelo, Shano, Yemenshi, Zoe, and Zyrogly. I, uh, I want to go a little bit further with my thanks this video to the patrons and to all the viewers in general. This is, uh, well, I'm horrified right now. I'm absolutely horrified of what's going to happen when I upload this. That's, maybe it'll be good for my channel. Maybe a bunch of trans people will discover me through it. I don't know, but one thing's for sure. My finances are going to change somehow, for better or for worse. Hopefully for better. And, uh, you guys, especially the ones supporting financially on Patreon and not skipping ads or whatever, have given me a lot of security. The kind of security that it takes to do something this horrifying. But, speaking of finances, I'm gonna go and enjoy some of South Carolina's dirt cheap gasoline and drive my way home. Thank you all, and good night.